Anyways, I want to get through this talk because I've got a crap load of code to show you guys. Some really good code, some really sophisticated code, and I want to bring everybody along on that journey. So the idea behind this talk is you've got uh, Yehuda Katz, you know, who has done a lot of refactoring in Rails 3 over the past year and a half. And the idea behind this talk was I took a look inside Rails 3, try to identify some of the really interesting design patterns that they've used inside Rails 3, and show you guys, you know, explain them in a way that everybody could understand them, not just Yehuda. So, um, but when I first started getting into it and I started, uh, you know, researching into it, I just found, I just went to find like the most interesting design patterns. And it so happened that some of the more interesting ones weren't done just by Yehuda, but by people like Carl Lurch, people like Josh Peak, and people like uh, Carl Huda, which, if you're not familiar, is sort of the alter ego when, you know, Yehuda and Carl pair at Engine Yard. They pair under the GitHub name Carl Huda, also known as Emo Cow. So, our topics look a little bit something like this. We're going to be going through looking at method compilation, looking at microkernel architecture, alias method chain versus super, active support concern, and finally, catch, throw, and bundler. So a couple techniques. Um, there's going to be a ton of code in here. So really, I know this is before lunch, but I think if you really focus down on some of these code things that I explained through the way, I think you'll find some really interesting patterns. So before we get our feet wet, you have to, the, the experts in the room, bear with me for a minute. I know there's probably some people who are beginner, beginning Ruby developers here, and I don't want to leave them out. So before we get into the advanced stuff, we've got to test the water a little bit. I apologize if this seems really basic, but I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Attribute accessor, right? Attribute accessor is the same thing as saying, you know, def city, def city equals. So basically we have some attributes, right? Initialize. When we call it initialize, basically that's I mean, when we call simple print new, it calls the initialize method, right? And we can set variables from there. When we have method missing, basically that means if there's a method in there and we call it like s.rubyconf, it's going to call the method missing method, right? Because it obviously doesn't exist. So if we go to the command line, and we do simple print new Taiwan, um, and it just is going to set the city variable, right? Then if we do s.rubyconf, we get back rubyconf Taiwan, right? Right. OK. Eval. OK. So here we've got some code. We've got a hash. We're going through each of the keys. We're going to go through each pair of the keys. Inside there, we're going to do something with eval. We're basically going to do eval key value. So basically what we're doing here is it goes through, iterates through this twice, and creates two instance variables, one called name and one called location, right? And actually runs that code right in there. So if we do puts name location, we're going to get bar camp Orlando, right? Right. <laughs> I, didn't, I guess this is an audience participation thing now. This is interesting. OK, so instance eval. If we have some code like this, we do class test print hello puts hello. Right now, if we do, if we create an instance of that, we get back hello. Now, another way we can do this is we can do test new instance eval and in print, and we get back the same thing. It's basically the same thing. Print is going to get run in the context of the class, right? right. Yay. Okay. Um, cool. Another way we can write this, right? If we did something like this, well, let me see. No, no, no. What am I trying to say here? Instance eval. We add the method right in there, and we can. You know, run the method. Makes sense. We get back hello too. Mind you, though, if we now went and created another instance at this point, it wouldn't work, right? Because we only added the method to that particular instance of the object. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, right. OK. <laughs> class eval. Let's make sure we all understand class eval. So we have class test. We can extend it. We can do something like this. We can add methods. We can open up our classes. That's why Ruby is awesome. We get back. If we print it out, we get Ruby 5. Another way we can do the same exact thing is by simply doing test class eval, right? So these two things, and we get back Ruby 5, sorry. <laughs> these two things are the same, right? right? Okay. Now that we have that all the way, let's jump into it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> method compilation. Let's take a look at method compilation. Take a look at a really simple example of where we might use this effectively on some simple code. And then we'll take a look at where this is implemented in Rails 3. So we've got simple print new. And we have push it, pop it, and top it. So let's say we have this code up here. We want the output to be this. What code do we need to write inside simple print 
to make that happen? Think about it for a moment. What do we need to make that happen? What might the code look like? Well, one solution might look something like this, where we basically have, first we're sending in the actions, we're setting the actions attribute accessor, we're then, we then have this print method, and then we're going to use method missing in this instance. So basically when we call those methods, it checks to see, well, is the method one of them that we initially sent in? If it is, then print it out. Make sense? That's a problem. I don't want to go too quickly. Think about it. I know it's almost lunchtime. So if we ran this code 3,000 times, 30,000 times, excuse me, we would find that it averages maybe about five seconds if we did it a bunch of times, at least on my processor. All right, so five seconds. Now there's another way we could write this. We could write this using method compilation. What would that look like? Well, over here, we're going to have class better print. We're going to send in the initialize, and we're going to go through each of the items in the array. Inside there, we're going to call instance eval, and we're basically going to define some methods for each of the items that we send in. Okay, now I'm going to move this over to the left-hand side of the screen. So basically, when this code is run, it's going to go through each item in that array and create methods for each item, right? So basically, it's creating each of these under the covers, one at a time, right? And then when it goes to actually call those methods, it's actually calling the methods that it generated on the fly, right? I say that too much. I'll stop doing that. Um, so using method missing, about five seconds. Using instance eval, about 3.5 seconds. That's about 30% faster. Now, you might be wondering what's going on under the hood. And I was wondering, okay, why, why is that? Why is it so much faster? So I jumped into RubyProf, you know, which allows you to do profiling, and I ran both of those using RubyProfile. So with method missing, it looks like this. Method compilation looks like this. If we get rid of the stuff that it has in common, we end up with this. So if you take a look at this, you can see that with the method missing version of this, it's calling each of these you know, 90,000 times. It's checking to see if the string matches. If it does, then it calls it. Whereas using method compilation, it's just calling the methods 30,000 times, and that's about it. So it's doing sort of less things, therefore it takes less time. The first commit that Yehuda did to Rails was using meth compilation. He basically went into the MIME types, how we declare the different MIME types for the controllers, and made it use method compilation so it was a lot faster when we go through and figure out what MIME types a controller will take. Another place you see method compilation in Rails 3 are with the callbacks. So stuff like before filter, after filter, around filter, skip filter. I'm not going to show you the code for this because it's very complex. But basically, if you think about this, instead of every time an action gets called, going through all the filters and say, do we call this one? Do we call this one? Do we call this one? Let's just compile a single method that says, when you call the show action, these are the three methods that you should call based on the before filters. So it just compiles a method. It's about 10 times faster with method compilation, substantially faster. Another place we see method compilation in Rails 3 now is with layouts. So when you think about layouts, right? basically the old layout code did something like this. It looked and said, OK, what layout do we render? Is it a string? Do this. If it's a symbol, do this. If it's a proc, do this. If it's a layout, do you know, is it false, do this. If it's layout, nail, do this. And basically, every time um, an action got called, it would go through, and all, go through all these conditionals. Right? So we made this faster uh, using method compilation. Let's take a look at that code. So this is the actual code from inside Rails. I apologize if it's a little faint to see in the back. Um, basically, if it's a string, let's do a class eval and create a method called underscore layout. If it's a symbol, create the underscore layout method, do something. If it's a proc, create the underscore layout method. So basically, it's going through. And of course, the first time it runs this, but the second time, it's simply going to be calling the underscore layout method. So that's an example, uh, a couple examples, of how we've used method compilation in Rails 3 to speed things up. Next up, we're going to be talking about microkernel architecture. And one really good example of this, we see an abstract controller in Rails 3 which was predominantly the work of Carl Lurch. So previously in the action controller stack, it had a lot of stuff in one package, a lot of stuff in one package. The first thing they did to clean this up 
is they moved their, all the router stuff, all the routing dispatch stuff into action dispatch. Right? The next thing we can see is we identified certain components that are common, that are at the common at the very base level, and put those sort of on top of something we call abstract controller. And if you take a look inside of Rails, inside the Rails source, you would see that there's an abstract controller directory now, and each of these you know, is a one-to-one -one mapping between you know, the different um, modules. So it's really easy to, if you want to learn about callbacks, you go read about callbacks in that file. The only file that doesn't, that obviously didn't, doesn't have a pointer here is base, right? That's the very base abstract controller. Let's dive into that code and see what it looks like. So here is abstract controller base. Right? It's an abstract class. And the guts of it are all in that one method called process. It basically calls the action. Somebody does a request, calls the action, renders out the action. There's a couple other methods that might look familiar here if you've ever did, dove into the internals like controller path, action methods. But that's, that's basically the gist of it. So we've got action controller base. It's a microkernel with a bare minimum needed for dispatching. And we have all these additional modules that we can then stack on top of it to give it additional functionality. Maybe we, or if we're creating our own controller, we would start out with abstract controller and only layer the modules that we need. But we can pick and choose that way. Some of the stuff that, this, that these do, you've got your before filters in here. You've got your helpers in here. And you've got your layouts in here. We saw some layout code a minute ago. That's where this resides. So we've got abstract controller base. One layer up from abstract controller base, some people might consider its own microkernel, is action controller metal. One of the benefits of having this abstract controller with these different modules at the very bottom level means now we can use them in one other place where we need them in our Rails app. This is action mailer base. So at the very bottom of Action Mailer Base, this used to have a, you know, a whole other separate you know, set of files, set of classes, set of modules. Now at the bottom of, abs of Action Mailer, we've got Abstract Controller Base, reusing a lot of code, keeping it more dry. Now back to Action Controller Metal. Right? Metal is where we start seeing rack. It's not until we get to the metal layer where we see just enough to make it a rack compatible Rails app. Okay? So let's jump into Metal. Here's what metal kind of looks like. It's an abstract class. The first thing we're going to see is the call method. I think I was here two years ago talking about rack, or three years ago talking about rack, right? So if you guys are familiar, the main component of rack is that call method, which we can see right there in metal, right? Um, so a request comes in, it calls action. Action goes through the middleware stack, calls the dispatch method. And hey, look, in the dispatch method, it calls the process method, which we saw a minute ago in abstract controller. So it basically calls up to abstract controller, renders the action. And if you're familiar with Rack, you'll be able to recognize that, that basically it returns the status headers and response body, because that's right from Rack. So at the very bottom of this architecture, we have abstract controller base, all the modules we can stack on top of that. We have action controller metal, and metal also has a bunch of objects much of modules, excuse me, that you can stack on top of that. When you start adding these modules that layer on top of metal, you start getting rails, and you start feeling like rails. Um, and if you take a look inside the uh, source, you're going to see that there's also a metal folder which contains all of these modules we can layer on top of it. Some of the stuff that this gives you, this is where we get our redirects. This is where we get that new cool response to syntax. Right? So it's these modules that you know, make, make rails feel like rails. So let's jump into the very top level, the one that you guys have all heard before, probably written it a couple times before, Action Controller Base. So here's what Base looks like. All that Base is at this point is it includes a bunch of modules. So it lists all these modules in an array. And at the very bottom right, you're going to see it basically goes through and calls include on all of them. Right? So basically include all this stuff. Go through each of them and include that. Now, when I first saw this, I looked at this and wait a second, how is that right? There's abstract modules and there's metal modules. Shouldn't they all be included in here? That was a little bit confusing. But what I came to realize is when I started looking inside the metal modules, you see inside the metal modules, the abstract modules get included inside the metal modules, just where they're needed. Right? So everything's getting included, 
but where it's actually being pulled in might be inside another module that needs it. We'll get back to that in a bit. So here's the architecture diagram of the whole stack. Right? At the very bottom, you've got abstract controller base and the modules that layer on top of that. One layer up, you've got action controller metal and the modules you can layer on top of that. And sitting at the very top is the action controller base. The action controller base includes some of the abstract modules. It includes some of the metal modules. And metal includes some of the abstract modules. So there's your architecture diagram of the sort of new uh, you know, microkernel architecture of the action controller stack. So that's an example of microkernel architecture. And one really cool side effect of this is all of a sudden Rails has become a lot more readable. This whole stack has become much more readable. It's a lot less intimidating to jump in there and go, oh, I need to learn about you know, rendering. I want to rewrite that. OK, well, I'll look in the rendering module. And everything that, it needs, that I need to know is going to be in that one module. And this can be better documented. So I really highly encourage you the next time you, know, you, you think about you know, why is this behavior in Rails? Why is it happening like this? Feel free to jump in and read the code. It's become a lot more readable. OK, we've got a couple more topics, but we have to test the water one more time. OK, and everyone's got to be on the same page with modules. So including modules, right? So we have this module print method. Basically, you know, if I do include print method and I do test new print, I'm going to get back Ruby. So that's including it as an instance method. If I want to include it as a class method, I use the extend parameter. Hopefully you guys all remember these basics. And then I can do test print and get back Ruby 5. What if I want to include both instance and class methods at the same time? Right? Oh, I'm one step ahead of myself. Um, so what if I want to do that? So here I've got an instance method, and I've got a class method, and I want to include them both in here. Right? Well, I have to do a little bit, something a little bit tricky. And Adam touched on this a little bit on his, in his talk. Basically, we have to do self-include. right? And so this is how we, do, we add the extend. Right? So include normally does, is just for instance methods. But if we want this to also give us the class methods, we have to use this self-included little block here. How many people have written this type of code before, just out of curiosity? OK, about half the room. OK, it's about right. Cool. Another way we can write this is base extend. Right? It's another way we can do it. Same thing. We can do base extend. And this leads us to talk. So, so now that we have the basics out of the way, we're going to jump in and talk, talk about some alias method chain versus super. And then we're going to go into active support concern. All right. So. Here's your next code challenge. This is our class. That's the parent class. We have an, a uh, class user inherits from generic user. We need to be, we're going to do puts user new name. And if we do this, with this code, we're going to get output Greg Pollock. But the output we want is Mr. Greg Pollock. But here's, here's the catch. We can't modify the classes at all. We have to use some metaprogramming to modify the classes. Okay. And all we can do is you know, basically do uh, right there, include mister. So we have module mister, and what goes in there? That's the question. What goes in there to make that work? Well, one way we might solve it is basically have do the self-included block, right? And here we're going to say alias name without Mr. Name, right? What does that do? It basically makes it so that if we call name without Mr., it calls the same name method. Then we're going to define our own method in this module called name with Mr., which calls name without Mr. So if we call name with Mr., it's going to be Mr. plus name without Mr. Now we're going to add one more alias down here, alias name name with Mr., right? So that basically cancels out the name up there and basically makes it alias to this method instead. Right, right, right. So that works. Um, now, another way we could write these two alias methods, you see these two alias methods down here? Another way we can write that is, of course, alias method chain, right? So alias method chain is basically those two alias lines, but simplifying it to one line. Who here has used alias method chain before? OK. About the same. Very good. Um, right. So obviously, yeah, we can use the alias method chain there, and, and that would work. And so this is one pattern that would work. However, given this code, there's a much, much simpler way to do this. Anyone? 
Super, right, right. With the same code, we can use super. And basically, because it's a, you know, it's a parent class of that, right, it's going to go through and call Mr. on there, and then call the super class. Great topic. Much simpler. So what this is telling you is that if you code in a certain way, you don't need to use alias method chain. You can use super when you try to override things. And we see this a lot in abstract controller, which you guys are now experts on because I showed you the architecture diagram, right? So in abstract controller, you know, I mentioned here, and you'll notice here, so, so basically Metal has a helpers module. And you'll notice here also abstract controller also has a helpers module. So when I first saw this, I was like, huh, what's going on? Why does abstract controller have helpers and Metal have helpers? And what additional functionality does the Metal helper give? So let's take a look at some of that code. So here we've got the abstract controller helpers. And this basically goes through, returns a list of modules, you know, and all your helpers, modules for helpers. That's all it does. The metal helpers module, all it basically does is give one piece of functionality on top of it. It gives you helper all. So if you ever use helper all, it basically says, you know, this controller can use all the helpers, right? And basically, if you look inside the code, you're going to see that it basically goes through and says, if the argument exists all, add all the application helpers onto args, then call super. Right. So that's how sort of the modules are laid on top of each other. They sort of extend from each other and really take advantage of super. So that's alias method chain versus super. Next up, and uh, Adam talked a little bit about this, and I'll go to it in a little more, a little more depth, is active support concern. The most majority of this work was done by Josh Peake. That's him. No, I'm just kidding. Who knows? Maybe it is him, for all we know. Um, but uh, let's jump into active support concern. Okay. So let's say we have this bit of code, and let's say that it includes bar camp 2010. Right. I've got this module. What goes in this module to make that code work? Another code challenge. What goes in there? There's a couple different ways you could solve this. Right. I'm going to solve it using this method. I'm going to say self-included class eval. In there, I'm going to set a class method. And maybe just to be complex, I'm going to make title a method. So let's say module class methods, def title. And then we do extend class methods. Right. So Doing those two pieces of code, we get back bar camp 2010. Now there's an easier way to write this, right? We can write this using active support concern, which Adam, again, briefly touched on. So how would we do that? Well, we could do something like this. If we do included self year 2010, these two are now the same. So here's some of the differences. You'll notice now we're no longer having to include the class methods. And we're using this included block to wrap what we ran inside class eval. Right. So it's basically the same thing. So basically, what does active support do? It does actually four different things, and we're going to cover them all. The first thing it does is looks for class methods and extend them. Right. So for example, if we have something like this, right, it's basically going to take, if we have a module inside our module called class methods, and it's automatically going to, going to include that. The second thing that it does is it's going to look for instance methods and include them. So we've got module instance methods here. And basically, it's going to automatically get them included inside of the class. The third thing that active support concern is going to do is it's going to class eval everything in that include block that you saw a minute ago. So basically, if we had some simple code like this and we included it, it's going to take that, run that inside of the class. And lastly, and I think most interestingly, it's basically going to include modules that get their included hook run on the base class, right? So basically, we have a top module that looks like this. We have a bottom module that looks like this, right? And basically, one module, the thing to notice here is one module is including another module. And they both have the included block in there, OK? Now, what's going to happen here is when we include it inside of a class, both of these included blocks are going to get run in the base class that was included by them. Before, this would not be 
possible. Previously, you would have had to, to get this functionality, you would have had to do this. You've had to do include my foo, include my camp. And only then would it run these, both these methods in the proper sort of base class. But of course, we don't need to do that now. It properly runs that included block in the class that includes them. Does that make sense? So that base class. And a good example of where we see this again is back in the methods we were looking at a minute ago. If we took a look inside this class here, right? So we've got the base metal helper and we've got the abstract controller helpers. You can see that you've got one includes the other. They both have the included blocks. And if we take a look and we include them inside, you know, action controller base, we're going to see that both of these included methods are getting run on the base class. Cool. So that is active support concern. How am I doing on time? Pretty good? Just going to go. Lunch is at what time? I got 10 minutes. Dude, sweet. OK, I can get through everything. OK, catch throw. So we're going to talk a little bit about catch throw. Yeah, I saw this. You see this picture? And it just brings back memories. But uh, no, that's not my kid. But it's funny because it's like you see this picture, and it's not just the fear of, you know, oh my gosh, is that kid going to be all right? I don't know if there's any fathers in the room. But there's also that fear that, you know, I've been there, and, you know, you go and you do something like that, and you throw it up in the air, and all of a sudden you're realizing, oh my God, did I just really just screw up really badly just doing this? <laughs> not just the kid, but just it's like, oh my God, what was I thinking? Anyways. Um, so let's, let's talk a little about uh, try catch and throw some babies. I mean, not. Um, so if you think a little bit about Bundler, I'm not going to give you guys like an intro to Bundler or anything. I think enough people have sort of heard what it is. But when you think about what it's doing under the covers, it's basically doing a depth first search of all your dependencies, right? If you remember back from your college days, it's depth first search. So it's starting on the left hand side, going through, trying to resolve all the dependencies. Then it's going to go on the right-hand side and try to resolve all the dependencies. And if one of them conflicts, well, that could have repercussions in a few places. It's going to have to jump back to the other projects. Not only is it going to have one that works, but then jump back to the other projects and see if you know, we need to keep a different version there. And if we had to switch versions there, then are all the dependencies under that going to be compatible with that version too? Right. It's not a simple piece of code, which is probably why it's sort of taken a while to get Bundler right. I think they've rewritten it like 10, 12 times to get it right. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you take a look at some of the really complex code, they're using some interesting control flow. So control flow. Basically control flow, like these stuff, right? You've got your conditionals. Another form of control flow that we use in Ruby is your, your method return, method invocation. We use raise and rescue predominantly for errors. And there's one other that we rarely use in Ruby that not too many people know about called catch and throw. Who here has ever used catch and throw before? Even less. OK, good. Yeah, okay. That's about right, probably. So what is, what is catch throw? Okay. Basics look like this. So you declare a catch. And then somewhere inside that catch block, you have a throw. And basically what that's going to print out, it's basically going to skip everything else after that. So in this case, it would print out, this will not get executed. And then. It, what's interesting about it is you can also return stuff. So if I do throw marker and return hello, we're basically going to get, you know, this will get executed and it will return hello. Right? So this is, you know, kind of similar to, you know, when we do throw and rescue, begin, rescue, you know, raise. Um, but that's predominantly for error messages, you know, and this is more for control flow. So let's go back to this diagram. We thought a minute ago about, you know, how we're doing the depth first search here, going through all sorts of different stuff. It goes all the way over here, and then it has to sort of jump back over here doing some sort of control flow. Right? So inside Bundler, I'm going to show you a little bit of code. So basically, we've got this. When we're resolving a requirement, this is inside Resolver. It's a really cryptic piece of code if you ever really want a really complex piece of code to wrap your mind around of. Um, so when resolving a requirement, we basically do catch and give it a requirement name. When an activated gem is conflicted, at that point we want to jump back to the initial requirement. And the way they do that is by doing throw. So we return the parent name, existing required by last name, right? So that's going to jump back to that point in the code. When a gem is not activated but its dependencies conflict, 
it's also going to do another throw and send it back to where it was resolved initially. Right? So that's sort of a glimpse into catch and throw. And that's pretty much, we got through a lot, I think, in that talk. But if there's any sort of moral of the story that I hope you guys take away from this, it's don't be afraid of reading the source, right? Because it's become a lot easier to read. And don't be afraid of making it your own. With a lot of these, sort of the microkernel architecture and all the different modules, it's become easier than ever to create your own version of Rails if you really wanted to. You want to create a controller that's maybe just specifically for serving up code, you know, JSON for iPhone apps or something, right? You could easily go in there and start from abstract controller and simply build and build and build and only take what you want, nothing more. And you could create your own little skinny application stack. So it's become much easier to customize, which I think is good. I think it'll help Rails sort of uh, stay mainstream. Um, let's create commons. Um, a couple things. Uh, so I've got slides. You can download slides with the URL up at the top. Um, if you like the talk, there's, uh, you can rate it. Please rate it. Give me feedback. I'm always looking to improve. Um, really appreciate you guys coming to the talk. Um, we printed out some Envy Lab stickers, and we've got some Ruby 5 stickers up here. If you guys want any, feel free to come up and grab a sticker sheet. They're kind of neat. Um, and also, um, I do the Ruby 5 podcast, and I always carry around my portable microphone. So if you create some sort of open source tools, uh, you know, or you did a, like a recent release or you have some library that nobody knows about and you want to get the word out, please come find me during the conference. Maybe we'll get a little audio and get you on Ruby 5. Um, do I have any time for questions or we'll, take, we'll go to lunch? And, you, and questions, you can take questions afterwards. We can take questions now and if people want to go to lunch, they can. Okay. Yeah, well, I appreciate you guys coming. If you want to go and get a jump on lunch, you're welcome to. Otherwise, are there any questions? Oh, everyone's hungry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I don't remember what example was, but there was, a, there was a point where you were showing code that uh, it was in the initializer, and you were calling something that was doing instance eval. Right. Uh, what would be the difference there between just if self is if self is the instance? What would be the difference there of using plain old eval rather than instance eval? Was it a was it a style issue? Or <laughs> Let's take a look at the slide later because I, I can't picture everything. Just so sorry. Um, any other questions? Or, oh, I think everyone's dispersing. If you have any questions, just come find me. Come up here afterwards. Thank you, guys.